We're done legging up the chair. We're now going to move on to the back. And every step from now on is going to make this look more and more like a chair. But before we can build the back, we're going to have to make some parts. When we were legging up the chair, I talked about the role of the, uh, the legs angles in creating strength in the undercarriage. The back is equally strong, but it's strong in a different way. The back is a web of tough, flexible pieces woven together to create a tough and flexible structure. It works on the same principle as a suspension bridge. Tough, flexible pieces woven into a, uh, a, a flexible structure. We're going to use oak because oak is tough and flexible. When all these pieces are woven together, we will have a back that does not resist the person sitting in the chair, but a back that instead absorbs the person sitting in the chair. It can be very disconcerting if you're standing behind the chair when somebody sits in it because you see the chair move as it absorbs the sitter. As we work on the back, this is a real handy device. It's a gauge block. We jokingly refer to it as the Incra stick to make fun of the uh, fascination that a lot of woodworking has with measuring to the thousandths of an inch. This block has built into it a number of critical dimensions. It's 7 8 inches wide by 5 8 inches thick. That's exactly the dimensions of the arm rail. It's the end of the spindles. It's 10 inches long with a mark at 7 inches. That will help us in laying out and fitting the spindles. So if you make yourself one of these, uh, it's, it's worth having. You'll be, you'll be seeing me use it a lot through the making of the back of the chair. So once again, I'll review those critical dimensions. 7 8 by 5 8 10 inches with a line at 7 inches. The first pieces we're going to make are the arm and the bow. As I said, they're oak, but this is not oak that was obtained at a lumber yard and sawn from a board. A couple of problems doing it that way. Wood that you're going to get from a lumber yard was sawn and the process of sawing ignores grain direction. So you end up with pieces that may or may not be weak uh, and incapable of being bent. The second is that the process of kiln drying sets the lignin in the oak and prevents it from uh, successfully bending. This wood has never been kiln dried. It was taken directly from the log in a splitting process called riving. By splitting, we follow the grain in the, uh, in the log and we obtain pieces where the, that has continuous grain from one end to the other. And that gives us the maximum strength and flexibility that we're going to need. Let's go make these pieces. So we're going to shape the arm rail in the thickness planer. We're going to start with the 7 8 dimension first. By the way, those of you who took classes with us at the Windsor Institute remember Don. Uh, he and I work together, and so if you have a friend who can help you, this, this is always a little bit easier as a two-man job, but you can do it by yourself if you have to. dimension. Now we're going to do the 5 8 
Next we're going to make the bow. The bow is going to end up square and so I'm only using one dimension on here and that's the 7 8 I'm going to use the 7 8 but I'm going to leave the piece just slightly bigger than the gauge block. So I'm going to be really 15 16 of an inch but the gauge block will allow me to feel uh, that I'm slightly larger. just a little wider, 15 sixteenths. The bow right now is square in section, 15 sixteenths of an inch. It's going to go into the chair round in section at 7 eighths inch diameter. So it's just slightly oversized. We're going to make it round using a go, no go gauge. The gauge has a one inch hole that we're going to use. And we're going to get the bow so that it will pass through the one inch hole. If it'll pass through the one inch hole, that means it's already under one inch and at the seven eighths that we want it to be. If we passed it through the seven eighths hole, it would be too small. So I've set it up in a vise. We're going to do the rounding like this. It's not uncommon for guys to attack their arm rail with the draw knife when they should be working on the bow. So to avoid confusion, set it aside so that it can't pick it up by mistake. Now start by knocking off the corners. Now, a couple of things to notice. First is, I'm not working in a shave horse. I'm working on a, in a vise. The shave horse had no association with Windsor chair making until the mid 1980s, when the guys that were making Appalachian ladder backs discovered Windsors and started making them and they imported their tradition into the Windsor tradition. The shave horse is incredibly inefficient. Look how far I'm able to work in a single stroke. And notice that I'm not just using my shoulders, I'm using all the major muscle groups in my body. So don't waste your time with a shave horse. It's terribly inefficient both in time and in the use of your muscles. The other thing to notice is how I'm holding the draw knife. The draw knife seems to suggest that I hold it like this but I hold it in whatever way is convenient and accomplishes what I want.
we're going to move on to this tool, this little plane here called a fork staff. Notice that the fork staff has a concave sole. That'll allow it to track on a round edge. Notice too that I have completed all the draw knife work. So I don't do some draw knife work, then go to the fork staff, do some more draw knife work. I'm not jumping back and forth between tools. I do all of one operation and then move on to the next. So while my right hand is pushing the tool, my left hand is supporting the work so that it doesn't flex. Now, the go gauge will allow you also to see where you're high. So instead of having to shave the whole bow, I just shave those areas. Now, if you don't own a fork staff, you can do this with a spoke shave but this is my preferred tool. And there we go. If it'll pass through a one inch hole, it's already down to just about seven eighths. So there's the bow, all ready to move onward. Now the arm rail and bow are bent at 46 inches. So we have to measure them and trim them to length. I need to mark the center because when I bent it, the center will be what I align. And half of 46 is 23. So I've marked the center, and I'm going to do it with a Sharpie, and I'm going to mark all the way around. I'm going to do that for a couple of reasons. I use the Sharpie because I can see it. When this comes out of the steam box, I don't want to be looking for that center mark, trying to figure out where it is. If I use a pencil or a, uh, an ink pen, I could, it, it, it will obscure the, the, the mark. This is very visible and easy to see. I also mark it all the way around so that, again, I'm not looking for the surface. I don't want to waste a lot of time when I'm bending. Finally, I'm going to trim to that dimension. And as a safety thing, I always like to grip the waist in the vise so that my other hand is far away from the cut. And there we go. That's just a test to make sure that I'm in the center of the bow, that it balances. There we go. Both trimmed to 46 inches, the 23 centers located, and the marks made all the way around. For safety, when you open the steam box, I'm going to take the piece of wood out with a pair of tongs, and I'm going to take it from down below because when, this, when I open up the box, the steam comes up this way, and I can avoid scalding myself.
Okay. If you've taken classes at the Windsor Institute, you remember my friend Don here, who's bending with me. I don't know how many hundreds of times Don and I have done this. If you, you get the form, the, the shape of the bending form, when you download from the website, it comes with the seat pattern. And you can see the form, it's pretty simple. Backboard, holes strategically placed for wedges. Oops. There we go. Now we'll tie the, the arm because as it dries, if it's not restrained, it'll tend to straighten out. We don't, we don't have to dry the part on the form. We nearly have to let it cool on the form because while it's hot and wet, the wood is soft and flexible. Once it's cold, although it may be wet, it's hard and uh, it won't uh, change shape once we take it off the form. But we'll let it sit here for a couple of minutes just to cool off so it's cool to the touch. And then this can come off and another piece can be bent. Now we go. Now that'll hold its shape now that it's cool. Okay. The back strap is just a piece of of banding with a couple of blocks on the end. But what it does is it gives support to that outer edge. Now as you bend, the wood will frequently talk to you and you'll hear it snapping and popping. <clears throat> you can bend by yourself it's just easier if you have somebody, uh, another pair of hands. And of course, one of the reasons I love to bend with Don is that he's an old hand at this. Lots of experience. And again, pull the string tight. You don't want the piece to open up as it dries. There we go, we'll let this cool for a bit and it'll be ready to come off. Here's our arm rail. When you bend a piece of wood, it seldom comes out perfectly the same length on both sides. It, it frequently uh, stretches more on one side or shifts slightly. And so we're going to go through a process that we call balancing the arm rail. And that is to make it so it's the same length on both ends. What I'm going to do is I have a score line here in my bench top, which is parallel to this front edge. The distance is not important, but it's about a foot. I'm gonna take and put the, the arm like this on the scribe line so that I can see this crescent and I arrange it until it's symmetrical. I'm ignoring the center line because it doesn't mean anything right now and once I've got it to, to the best placement I just push the arm rail straight back until what extends overhangs on this edge added to what 
overhangs on this end equals one inch. Looks like I'm going to come out around three eighths and five eighths. The, uh, uh, the spec sheet says that you bend at 46 inches, but the final dimension will actually be 45. And this is the inch that we're taking off. There we go. I've marked it on both sides, and that's where I'll cut. I'll do that, and I'll take off the string. Okay, now I'll trim off that waist. Once again, there's our inch. I don't want to leave those laying around on the floor. Next step, we're going to have to glue these hand blocks on here. They're going to give us, allow us to form the scroll of the scrolled hand that's, uh, uh, that's a nice feature on this chair. But we have to joint these edges. And uh, if you do this on a mechanical jointer, you're a more courageous person than I am. I'm instead going to do it this way. This is my number seven jointer plane. Now put it upside down in my vise like this. And I'll joint this surface and this surface, two mating surfaces. And there we go. Comes out as perfect as you could ask. Now we do the arm rail. And I just want to make sure I keep this vertical so that I'm jointing at a right angle. And that'll give us a perfect joint. Now we'll glue it up, set it aside to dry. Okay, I'm going to glue the blocks onto the arm. The blocks are just slightly thicker than the arm, so that I'll give an overhang on both sides and I'll plane it flush before I continue working. Now I'm using yellow glue. Why? Because I want to be able to do this job as quick and have it harden up as quickly as I can so I can get working on the back of the chair. I could use white glue if I wanted to wait overnight, but I don't want to. I want to move along more quickly. So. Okay, that's one. There we go, with our hand blocks glued on, 
We'll set the side to dry and then we can get started on the back of the chair. We're going to place the stumps in the chair. The stumps are made of maple. Remember the analogy of the back of the chair to a suspension bridge. A suspension bridge is a web of tough, flexible pieces, but it's anchored on both ends in concrete piers. These function as the concrete piers for the back of the chair. These are the anchors. That's why they're made of maple. Maple is rigid, unlike the oak, which is flexible. It will, these will function as the piers that secure the back of the chair. Now those, those stumps have both a flare and a slope angle. They're the same angles used in the legs. The difference is that they're swapped. The legs were 14 degrees of splay, 10 of rake. The stumps are 14 of forward slope and 10 of flare. Going to set my bevel squares for 14 and for 10. Once again, I have the problem of confusing the bevel squares. To make sure I don't do that, I'm going to use this technique. Using my painter's tape, I've got my flare angle, the side to side angle, seen from the front of the chair, taped to this winding stick. It has the added advantage of allowing me to span the saddling of the seat. And I'm not going to pick it up and use it in the wrong location. I start out, as with my legs, using the Van Hovenometer to check my angles. I have I need um, um, uh, forward slope. My flare angle is not bad. I can live with that. Now, a word about the stumps. Getting them precise is not as critical as it is with the legs. They're smaller pieces and they're in a very busy back made up of multiple pieces, whereas the legs stand pretty much by themselves. So we have more flexibility in the stumps than we had in the legs. As I ream, I'm going to pull I pulled forward I want to bring that out just a little bit to increase the flare. My slope angle now, I could come forward just a little bit. So as I make this correction, I'm going to do it at about 8 o'clock. There we go. Now, again, slope and flare are precise, have a precise definition. When I measure my flare, I have to hold the winding stick over the other hole so that I'm measuring at a right angle to the center line. When I measure slope, the bevel square handle has to be parallel to the center line. If it's not, I can get any angle. So I have to reference the bevel squares 
to the center line. And that's satisfactory. I can live with that stump. And once again, I check. That's pretty good for my flare. And my slope, I'm consistent. My slope needs to come forward just a little bit. We check. I could maybe bring, get just another uh, degree of, uh, of flare. Once again, I'm going to check my second bevel with the winding sticks. And they tell me that my, uh, uh, my forward slope is fine. So I'm going to pick up just a little bit more. of splay. There we go. That's perfectly satisfactory. Check once again for wind. And they're good. We're ready to move onward. Thank you for watching this content. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And check back frequently for more Windsor chair making tips and tutorials.